during lockdown, I was diagnosed with mania, right? And uh, getting that diagnosis allowed us to uh, see and understand how much of my work in the past had been driven uh, by my manic behavior, right? And uh, what also came out of it was something beautiful uh, on social media during lockdown. So um, my background uh, initially was youth and community work based. So I'd volunteered uh, in a local community centre when I was younger as a, as a youth worker. So I was helping out with some troubled kids, right? And they were given the work as loads of grief. So I went and helped out, took them rock climbing and stuff like that. Ended up working all over the North East. Worked in South East London with um, inner city gangs. Went over to Jamaica, I worked on a homeless project out there. Worked with kids from Israel, Palestine, Chernobyl. Ended up in Bradford after the uh, race riots and turned, it was an area, I was an area community development manager, turned a youth centre into a community centre. And then I came back to the North East and I was working um, as part of Bernardo's teenage pregnancy team with young dads and we won like all parliamentary award, British midwifery award, British uh, medical journal award. So the, fin uh, the financial crisis happened and then all the services for young people were stripped. Uh, everything from youth centres, community centres, after school clubs, breakfast clubs, everything was all cut away because of austerity. So I thought, right, what we're going to do, we're going to have to try and do something. So what are kids into? They're into music, social media. This generation's the most ethnically diverse generation that Britain's ever known. Uh, they consume more hours of media a week than they get sleep. And they're the most connected generation. So I decided to make an interactive film series, as you do, right? So... Um, my introduction to media was a production company had asked us to help go and make a film about, um, about teenage pregnancy and it ended up winning a BAFTA and another production company had asked us to make a film about knife crime and it won a Royal Television Society Award and then I was working at the BBC and my job was to work with disadvantaged kids and give them a chance to try like different forms of media so it was like a big uh, tour of the UK I would go into an area a few months before and uh, go and like source like groups of disadvantaged young people and then pair them up with like say like the guys that done like Wallace and Gromit or uh, a caller to do like um, to do writing and make a film in three days that kind of stuff so I decided after the financial crisis to create Tri Life so if you can remember the old choose your own adventure books that's what Tri Life is but it's all in film so the action plays out and then you get to decide what happens next. Do you go to the party, yes or no? Do you take the drug? Do you carry the knife? Do you do whatever, right? Do you have sex? Is it protected? Is it not? And the, the whole point of it was to allow young people to experiment in a safe environment and go back and make choices or make mistakes on behalf of a film character and see what happens. So it's all based on sound science. And uh, what I didn't realize is that we'd wrote the world's most complex interactive film ever made, and we'd wrote like 455 pages of script, and a normal feature film is only 90 pages, so we basically wrote like two-thirds of Lord of the Rings trilogy, right? <laughs> so uh, we launched that, and I remember I got to like 10,000 likes on Facebook, and I was crapping myself, thinking like, this better not be rubbish this like, because I'm going to look a right dick, you know what I mean, in front of 10,000 people. But the, the numbers kept going up and going up and going up. So. The first episode was about drugs and alcohol and sexual health. The second one was gang violence and knife crime. Third one was mental health and suicide in young men. The fourth was child sex exploitation and grooming. The fifth was isolation and loneliness. The sixth was a bolt onto that. It was like a COVID add-on to that episode. And the seventh was uh, teenage pregnancy. Here's a trailer. You ready? Are you? Well, I am the one giving birth. <laughs> Come on then.
I know this isn't what you wanted from me. But of course it's not what we wanted for you. Who wants a pregnant teenage daughter? Let me out! Where do you think you're going? Where do you think you're going? So, um, cheers one, nice one. <laughs> so uh, we ended up amassing like uh, over 7 million people on, um, on social media, and then some weeks we were reaching 188 million people, right? And I haven't got a clue what I'm doing on social media. Uh, but it was all because like young people had been part of it, so young people wrote it. If, we, if I went into a university, you could access the, I could utilize the, um, um, drama students, film production, fashion, hair, makeup, you can get like the whole campus involved in the, in the process of it. We ended up winning innovation awards in health, social care, business, um, youth work, came runner up in outstanding contribution to youth work. We won a uh, pitch at the palace in both the People's Choice and Overall Award. Um, we won International Film Award, we won any amount of placement provider awards for uh, like working with uh, universities. So then I got to over to Hollywood, right, as a bit of a wild card. So all of the rest of them were like traditional filmmakers. And um, I come from a community background, so uh, everyone's like, sort of like, oh, where were you trained? And like, do you know this director? And do you know that one? And I'm really crap with names, right? I'm just like, I just don't know anyone, right? So I was like, no, like, this is what I've just made, you know, this interactive film. So we get up in Hollywood anyway, which was uh, pretty surreal. And I'm talking about trial life, and everyone else is selling films. And I'm like, this is just what we're doing. So um, the whole audience piles over, right? Everyone piles over and they're like, oh, he has a business card, come to a meeting, come to a meeting, come to a meeting. So that night I'm sitting in Arnold Schwarzenegger's favorite place, right? A burger joint with the exec producers of Crash, right? Having a burger. And then the next morning I had a scrap bit of paper from this woman and she said, will you come to Compton? And I was like, yeah, man, I would love to because I love working in the dodgy bits, you know what I mean? And I love me NWA. <laughs> So I'll get an Uber in the morning. I, like, I never Google her now because it was just a telephone number and an address, like, you know, like on this bit of paper. So I'm now sitting on the bottom of her bed having a cup of coffee, right? Our cat's attacking us. We've only got a TV in our bedroom and we're watching Donald Trump win the election, right? And uh, there's pictures of her with like Steve McQueen and Harrison Ford and Ridley Scott. And I'm like, whose house am I in here? <laughs> so it turns out I'm now on the way to Compton with the producer of Blade Runner, right? So I'm sitting there. Uh, in Compton and I'm teaching these young kids saying like you don't have to be a wealthy white man from Hollywood to make a film You've got the power in your pocket to change the world So we came out of this school Washington prep school and this woman walked past and she was like, what are you doing here? So I was like, oh, I've just been in here teaching these kids and I showed her a trailer of trial life on my phone So she gets on the phone Terry Terry is a white man in Compton. You should see his work. It's off the hook <laughs> so um, This guy's like right we're gonna come pick you up and I was like, right, okay, so, to cut a long story short, I'm now out on the drink with the heads of the Crips, right? <laughs> and if, for those that don't know that, right, it's like one of, the, one of the main gangs out there. So, anyway, I'm having a bit crack on with these lads, having a pint with them. And uh, I says to them, like, why don't we tell the real story of, like, the Bloods and the Crips, like, instead of, like, the Hollywood version, you know what I mean? Like, not the boys in the hood, but, like, let's, like, talk about, like, how it all came about and, like, the history and the culture and you know, like the devastation and the effects on mental health and everything that like, this has had on the, on the community. So um, I ended up having a chat with some people from the other main gang, and then I met some representatives from the Mexican Mafia, and I brought them together on stage. I had never been that scared. I mean, I've, I've watched kids get shot here. I watched them shoot them there, you know, loud out here. Mm -hmm. But when they did that one, it was boom, 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 boom. So this is real history. There is no other higher level to go to. We believe in Paul's vision. We're behind them. And uh, just think about what we could do. This is going to be a history lesson because the Crips, the real Crips, the real Bloods, and the Mexican Mafia have never came together to do 
anything Nothing like this. but kill each other. Really? Yeah. We have a chance here to do something that's never been done. A lot of the stuff you see on TV about Bloods, Cribs, Mexican Mafia, a lot of it's done wrong. It's not historically accurate. What if when I was a kid, I had a tri life? Okay, here's, here's a story about the Bloods, the Cribs, or the Mexican Mafia. Okay, and they're seeing the choices that happens when you make those choices, bad or good. Yeah, man. So, cheers. <laughs> so, um, just before uh, lockdown happened, um, I went and presented this to like Facebook uh, London, and I said to them, "Look, we've got like you know we've got uh, we've already like sort of." done a proof of concept on, on trial life in the UK, let's go and supercharge it, you know what I mean? Let's go and engage with these people and like, let's interview the OGs on like Facebook Watch and, and then like, do like a fly in the wall type documentary where we're showing the development of the, like, the, fic the fictional script in the background and then let's follow the kid from the street, like what we do with trial life, follow the kid from the street into, like, into audition, into script, read through, into wardrobe and then like, demystify like, how film is made and like, let's get the whole community involved. So, they loved the idea. I went and spoke at Facebook UK, I spoke at Facebook Europe. I was, uh, they took us to Facebook Grow and I was on stage talking with like Louis Theroux and that. It was flipping mad. And then they were going to fly us over to uh, San Francisco to go and present it over to Facebook Global. And then the pandemic happened. So around about the same time, I'd, I'd been awarded a bursary uh, through an organization called A Million Realities. And uh, they were looking for eight people, with, like uh, social entrepreneurs, with businesses in the UK, uh, like that had like a global uh, impact. And the difference with this bursary to most bursaries was that they wanted to support the founder and put the founder on the feet first. And I thought through all of my work in the past, working with other young people, I'd like uh, repaired myself and uh, put myself as best I could on my feet. And I th for whatever reason, it was just the right time, and I thought, right, now's the time. I've helped everyone else all my life. Now's the time, like, maybe to have a look and get a bit of support. So I poured my heart into this application form anyway, and went for an interview, and I got it, and this says to us, uh, come and meet where at Heathrow Airport, because we're going to take you away for a week. So uh, I turned up, and there was another seven fellows there, and we met each other for the first time. They took us to Morocco, and I spent a week doing, like, proper intensive therapy, right? So. It was hell, honestly. I hadn't repaired myself like at all, right? We'd, there was a professor of psychology there. We'd done like breath work, body work, and like all of this stuff. Like, you know, it's like I haven't uh, done any of this before, but I just threw myself into it and thought, right, I'm going to do it. And then the pandemic obviously happened, and I'd done weekly sessions with a therapist. And then every time lockdown eased, I went and done like EMDR for post traumatic stress. I'd done like hypnotherapy, hypnotherapy. I'd done constellation work, done all sorts of. Uh, of uh, work, I'd done a Hoffman course on childhood trauma, and uh, these things like completely broke us, you know what I mean? But then put us back on my feet. I cleared like a quarter of my brain, and uh, came back a much better person. But during lockdown, because I was doing all of this heavy lifting on myself, I felt a sense of responsibility for the seven million people or whatever we've got on uh, social media. But I didn't have it in us to to help anyone. But like obviously, my natural instinct is to try and you know, like support people because like, you know, lockdown was a strange time. So I was lying on bed and um, there was a guy playing a piano, right? And I just caught the back end of it. It was like a proper Bob Ross moment. I thought, oh, that sounds mint, that. So he's, he was on Facebook Live and he said, like, uh, listen, uh, goodbye, uh, Mary. Thanks for tuning in, Margaret. Um, you know, I'll see you tomorrow for more peaceful piano. So what I'd done is, uh, um, I set me alarm, and then the next day, I uh, reposted Peaceful Piano to the world, right? So instead of him saying goodbye to Mary, Margaret, Jane, he was now 10,000 views. So he crapped himself when he finished playing the piano and come over and seen 10,000 people. And I was like, oh, mate. I emailed or messaged him on Facebook and said, like, will you do, will you play a Peaceful Piano to the world? And then I thought, I've built this massive online community. Like, why am I keeping a hold of it? Why am I so precious about it? When the community's built it, why don't I hand it back over 
So I'll put an advert out and said, has anyone got like, any content you want to put out? Let's turn this social media page into a TV station. So then a friend got in touch and she created Wakey TV, which was like a proper loud, in your face, like sort of morning TV show all around mental health and around uh, getting yourself up and exercising and stuff you can do at home. Another friend from America got in touch and was like, let's interview actors because like, they're all at home, they're not, they're, they're not, like, no one can shoot films on out. Someone else got in touch and were like, let's do our little indie night. And then other composers from around the world all got in touch with Steve, who was playing peaceful piano, and we started putting on these massive concerts. And then a teacher at the university who was teaching psychology was like, let's do fireside chats about uh, mental health. And uh, the whole thing just ended up where, during lockdown, we've done this year. Just these guys were just staring at me, laughing, and I just lost my nerve, I guess. Why have you even bothered about them? Do you blame me? Just ignore them. I don't know why you even care about what they think. Yeah, but it's not about what they think. It's... It's just like the way they make me feel. Oh, God. It's just like the way they make me feel. It's just like the way they make me feel. It's just like the way they... It's just like the way they... It's just like the way they... You know, um, like, uh, there was plenty of times during uh, lockdown and stuff where I just felt like uh, my connection to society and stuff was, like, uh, you know, uh, very fragmented. But um, just because you can't do it personally, like, it doesn't really necessarily mean that your connection is lost. Thank you very much, everyone. Cheers, man. Um. First of all, thank you. Uh, always great to hear the latest in, in your journey. Uh, we're running a little short of time, so I just have one quick question, which is basically, what's next for you and Try Life? So we're making a, a climate action app for young kids, which is going to be like interactive uh, animation. And then we've got, uh, hopefully, a film funded in Durham around gambling, so another interactive film. And then I'm going to try and get back over to California and pick up uh, the Bloods, Crips, Mexico Mafia. And then on top of that, I'm writing a video game at the moment, which is like a Game of Thrones style video game, which is going to have a TV series spin off. And uh, I think that's all right. I think off of the top of my head, but I. <laughs> <laughs> which is the first that we'll, we'll see out, out in the wild, so to speak? Uh, well, I think the, like, so the climate action app is like, only a few weeks away. We've been working on that during lockdown. And then uh, the, I think the next thing after that will probably be the Durham thing and the video game is probably about a year off or something. Okay, great. Aye. Paul, thank you so much. Yeah, man, cool. Nice one. Cheers. Cheers, man.